Today we're looking at a introduction to the pneumatic system on FRC robots, specifically the way that Spectrum does it for the most part. Um, there is a lot going on. We're going to kind of gloss over some stuff that we'll expand on in the future, but you should have a pretty good idea of how everything is connected and kind of what the main functions of all the different pieces are. Oh, I guess I hit the wrong button. All right. Um, so this is the basic pneumatics model of like the entire system on the robot. Um, we're going to talk about kind of what each of these little pieces are and what they do. Um, but sort of the main point of all of this is to be able to eventually get us motion that this uh, pneumatic cylinder up here in the top right is doing. So we're able to um, have these cylinders that move in and out and they allow us to move different parts of our robot. Um, whether that's deploying intakes or um, some teams have used them to climb um, or a lot of times there's little small things like releasing or um, releasing a latch or something. You have these nice um, predefined motion that this pneumatic cylinder can give you. Like it extends a certain length that retracts um, and that allows us to do a lot of things really nicely mechanically. We're not going to talk about how we use them um, mechanically and how they're hooked and how they're actually like attached to mechanisms and things. That's not what today is. We're on the control side. So we're going to talk about how like we make sure the system's all ready and how we actually control it in uh, on our robots. So that's the model. This is what it actually looks like in real life. So this is a picture of pretty much everything or a lot of what was in the other model view where it was all laid out nicely. It all gets kind of it gets much more compact and harder to see on the real robot. So we're going to mostly spend time looking at the model um, today, but we'll come back to this picture and kind of look at how it actually, um, see what the real life model looks like and the real life parts and how they compare to the model. It's all, it's all the same. They're connected in basically the same ways, um, but it's just way harder to follow in this picture than it is in our nice little um, laid out drawn model. Okay, so the first part we're going to talk about um, is the compressor because pneumatics use compressed air. So the compressor is the kind of like the start of the whole system. Um, what the compressor does is it takes um, it takes outside air and it forces it into our pneumatic system. Um, and as it keeps doing that, it's taking more and more air and putting it into our pneumatic system. Um, the we basically are able to store more and more air into the same space. We're only allowed one compressor on the robot. There's a variety of different types of compressors you can use, but you're only allowed one, and that's the only compressor that can be used to um, generate all your stored air that you're going to use on the robot during a match. There's a video here for how a compressor works. We're not going to go into that today. It's not super important for what we're doing, um, but if you're curious, um, feel free to come back and watch that video. Um, so it's very similar to any of the compressors you've used to um, like fill up a car tire. Um, it's basically a motorized pump. So if you had like a hand pump to fill up a bike tire before, it's the same thing. But instead of you having to move it up and down, we have a motor inside the compressor that's basically turning and doing the same thing. Um, it's adding more and more air to our system. Um, one of the basic points of our pneumatic system is tubing. Tubing is how we actually connect everything together um, and allow air to flow from one part of the pneumatic system to another. We have two different sizes of tubing that we use on our robots. Um, quarter inch, which is the most common that almost every team uses. And then we also use a smaller size that's 5 seconds inch or sometimes four millimeter. They're basically the same. Um, and so this lets us just be just like have a smaller tube. It's easier to put into smaller spaces. Um, it's lighter. The, all the little fittings to connect everything are smaller. It lets us get by with basically just like a smaller setup by having the smaller tubing. Um, okay, so it's tricky to understand exactly how all the pneumatic stuff works if we don't have at least a um, intro idea to what air pressure is. Um, so you may have you may have introduced it when you've looked at filling up bike tires, car tires, um, basketball, soccer ball, anything where you have to put compressed air into something. 
Right, you felt it if you had to use your use your mouth to blow up like an inner tube or a pool toy or something. Um, and if filling up balloons, you know it gets harder and harder um, to fill up as it gets bigger and bigger, as there's more air inside whatever container you're trying to fill. It's harder for you to actually blow into. Um, that same concept happens in the robot, and the same concept happens with the compressor. So we're, the compressor, at the very beginning, it's pretty easy to put more air into the system. It's not, there's only, um, the air that starts in the system is basically the same amount of air that's all around us. We're at that same pressure. It's the same amount of air um, per volume if we haven't actually compressed any yet. Compressed is just to put more air into that space. Um, so as the compressor continue to run, it keeps adding more and more air to the system. And, that's, and that air builds up and builds up pressure because the air inside the system is basically wanting to expand and all the parts of the system, all the tubing and every part of the pneumatic system is basically stopping it from expanding and going out any further. Um, so that's the pressure that we're talking about is like the air in, on the inside trying to like expand out. Um, what that means is we can basically keep track of how much air is in our system by knowing how much pressure is in our system. Um, in FRC, we are limited to storing air at 120 PSI or pounds per square inch. Um, for our purposes right now, it's not important to know like exactly what a pound per square inch is or like have any sort of concept of that at the moment. Um, but just know like that number is kind of important for us. Um, that's what we're able to store air at in the robot. Um, gauges, which are these two boxes down here, are how we're able to um, visually measure the pressure in our robot. So this is how we're able to tell by looking at our robot and looking at these gauges what the pressure in our robot is actually um, at, a, at, at the, that point in the system. Um, so this is what the gauge that we use are. They're, the little, they're from Automation Direct. They're a company that makes um, a lot of different um, automation and mechanical and industrial um, components for different companies and things. Um, we use these tiny little gauges that allow hose or tubing just to be pushed right into the ends. Um, so we don't have to have any special connector. You just push the tubing right in and it gets locked in place. Um, somewhat of a sidetrack, but to undo these, they're called push connect connectors. You just push the tubing in and they connect. To undo, you take this little orange part and you kind of push it back. And then when you pull the tubing out, it comes right out. Um, when we get to do eventually more hands-on stuff, that'll make more sense. Um, okay, where I was. So the dial uh, shows you the PSI. So this dial over here, um, nice big dial. It actually, um, it's set up to show bar on the outside is kind of the main reading, but bar is um, not the units that we normally use. Um, so we use this inside dial in here to show PSI. Um, so if we wanted to know that the system had less than 120 PSI, we can see 100 is here, and then two more ticks gets us to 120, which is right here. So we would know that our system is legal and operating well if our um, main gauge showed 120 um, or less. It's normally a little under that. Um, OK, so that's how we were able to monitor basically how much air is actually in our system, is how much pressure we have stored in our system. OK. The um, next component is the regulator. And so that's the component right here between these two gauges. And the regulator is unique, and it basically limits the amount of pressure that can pass through it. Um, so you have an input side and an output side. Um, the little arrow down here, when you actually see one of these in your hands, it's kind of hard to see and it's pretty easy to get this backwards. But there's a little arrow right here and it points to the output side so you can know which one is which. Um, and air on the input side basically always has to be greater than or equal to air on the output side. Um, so what that lets us do is basically have two different pressures in our pneumatic setup. So we're able to store air um, over on the input side of the regulator at a certain pressure and then actually use the air at a lower side or at a lower um, at a lower level. 
Um, if for some reason the pressure got too big over here, the regulator does what's called vent and it'll lower the pressure back down and it won't let it stay um, higher than however you set it. And we set it by turning this little screw on top. Um, so as we tighten it, we're able to get a um, higher pressure over on this side. And as we loosen it, we're able to get a lower pressure over on this side. Uh, okay. The way we actually store our um, air, because we need some amount of volume. So it wouldn't work, because um, we actually need to basically use the air. Um, so we store air up to a certain pressure and we store it in um, tanks or reservoirs. There's a couple different names for these. Um, but we basically have multiple of these um, white plastic cylinders on our robot and they don't do anything else except for be a place to actually hold the stored air and wait for us to actually use it in our system. Um, so yeah, so they're basically just large volumes. Um, we normally have four to, I think the most we've had on our robot is like eight. Um, so we quite a few of these on the robot, they're all linked together with tubing. And they're just there storing up air pressure um, or storing up air so that we can use it in the system um, once our robot needs to actually move any of its actuations and make the cylinders go in and out. Um, we basically always use these white ones because they match our brand and our color scheme. Um, a lot of other teams will use these black ones because they're basically the same thing. Um, there's a variety of other ones. There's big aluminum like metal ones that exist too. Um, so there's a variety of different types you can use. But for us, it's normally been these white ones. Okay, um, a couple other parts before we get to the stuff that actually does the work. Um, we have this pressure relief valve. Um, it has to be mounted right up next to the compressor. So it doesn't have any actual tubing going between it. It uses like fittings. There's actually like metal um, fittings that allow the air to move through too. They're a little bit heavier, but they can't be, um, um, they can't be damaged as easily. So this pressure relief valve is actually a safety device. So its job is just to make sure we don't get too much pressure in the, in the system. Um, if something happened to the compressor or something happened somewhere else and we built up too much pressure, we went above that 120 limit that we talked about earlier. If we hit all the way to 125, this little pin right here will open up, will like come up and air will come out of all these little side vent holes and it'll lower the pressure back down until we're um, at 125 or less. So all of it does is it's just a safety device. Largely, it never has to do anything. Um, it's, not, it's not really common for us to build up more pressure than that. Like it almost never happens. Um, but if it does, it's there to prevent anything um, from getting too much pressure in it. Um, we do have to check it during robot inspection. It's one of the reasons why we call it out here. It is a required part of every robot that uses pneumatics. Um, and is one of the things that we just have to check during inspection to make sure it's operating properly in case something does happen. Um, okay, um, we're not gonna go too much into the electrical side of things, but it is useful to have a, some idea of what, um, how the electrical part of this works. So when we connect the pneumatics to the electronic system, we do it with the PCM which is the pneumatics control module. Um, and so it has a variety of function, but it basically connects to every um, pneumatic component that also um, has an electrical part of it as well. Um, so it connects to the RoboRio over the CAN bus. So similar to how the speed controllers or speed controllers, motor controllers, how those connect to the RoboRio. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Um, so it has CAN ports and it connects to the RoboRio. It also has power in, so it connects to the power distribution panel. Um, and then it controls the compressor. Um, so it has a outputs for the compressor. So it's the device that turns the compressor on and off. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of its other connections here in just a second. So we can see in the wiring diagram, it has compressor wiring. So it gets wired to the compressor. Um, Another thing that it connects to is known as the pressure switch. Um, so this can be um, anywhere on this side of the regulator. 
So we want to be measuring the pressure in this side of the system. Um, and it actually is the device that tells the PCM when to turn the compressor on and off. Um, so this is what it looks like in real life. And it has two, it has two spots for wires and they connect into the PCM over here next to the compressor. And it basically has um, a little bit of electronics and some mechanical systems inside of it that when the um, pressure in the system gets up to around 115 to 120 PSI, um, it signals to the PCM to turn the compressor off. And then once the pressure gets really low, so we've used pressure in our system, so we've had um, mechanisms moving, we've been doing things. Um, once the pressure gets down to 95 PSI, so we've used some air, the pressure switch will signal to the PCM to turn the compressor back on, and it'll start running the compressor again and try to get it back up to 115 or 120 PSI for it to turn back off. Um, so without this little thing, you wouldn't know when to turn the compressor on and off. So this is what's actually like kind of connects the pneumatic system to the electrical system. Um, okay, so the way the actual, how we actually do work is with this pneumatic cylinder. Um, so it uses air to um, move this piston in and out. So the whole thing is the pneumatic cylinder. The part on the inside that moves is the piston. Um, and it actually provides motion. So this is the most useful part um, for what we actually do. All of the other stuff is just in place to let us actually have these pneumatic cylinders that are moving things around. If we didn't have pneumatic cylinders, we wouldn't have any of the rest of it. It doesn't really serve a purpose to just store a bunch of air on the robot unless we're gonna actually use it. Um, so this is what a pneumatic cylinder looks like in real life. So this is it in its um, retracted position. So the little rod end over here is all the way back just like it is in some part of this animation right here, it is all the way back and you have the little rod sticking out the front. And then as we put air in, like it's doing in this animation, um, the rod will get pushed forward. And then if we put air in the other side, the rod will get pushed back. Um, in just a second, we'll talk about how we actually do that control. But we basically have one side with pressurized air and the other side is just open to the um environment just the rest of the air just like we're sitting in right now um and that allows us to have that movement because if you have um higher pressure on one side and you have low pressure on the other this side's going to want to expand and it basically can push the cylinder out um and it does it with um an amount of force basically in um in proportion to whatever the pressure is on this side um and how big the cylinder is too. So if we have a much bigger diameter cylinder for the same amount of force, um, for the, sorry, for the same amount of pressure, you're gonna get more force being pushed out from the end of this. Um, but it's also gonna take more air to do it, right? Because it has a much bigger um, volume, right? So you can imagine if we like had a cylinder that was half as big as this, it would take, half as much air to fill um, the side and actually move the, the cylinder back and forth. Um, so as we get a bigger cylinder, yes, you get more force, but you also need more air. So there's some trade-offs there. Um, and we'll talk about more of that in another presentation when we get more into advanced pneumatics and how we do some of those trade-offs and how we actually design using pneumatics. Uh, I briefly talked about atmosphere already. So, um, Atmosphere is basically just our zero. It's the air pressure that's around us all the time. It's the air we're breathing in. Nitrogen, oxygen, carbon um, dioxide, all that um, is all the little air molecules floating around us all, all the time. Um, there's some amount of pressure from just the air being um, kept in by the um, Earth's atmosphere, right? So there's some amount of pressure all the time. That's why air pressure can kind of change depending on your altitude and things. Um, and like oxygen levels and things. Um, but for us, our, our atmosphere pressure is basically zero and our gauges are reading the difference between the outside pressure and what's store, stored in our robot. 
Um, and that's important because this is how solenoids are able to work, is they're able to change one side of the cylinder from our um, air pressure that we stored in the robot to the atmosphere level. And that's how we're able to get that difference in pressure so we actually get movement. Um, so the solenoid is this part that is actually doing the control. Um, so it connects to the PCM here. We have a bunch of little slots here. There's eight of them on a PCM. So we could have eight of these solenoids all connected into here. Um, and when the solenoid tell or when the PCM tells it to, it's able to flip which one of its outputs gets the pressurized air and which one of the outputs is basically connected to, um, is basically open to the atmosphere um, so that air can all um, exhaust or vent. Um, and then we actually get movement in the cylinder. And that's what we're trying to do is get that movement in the cylinder. Um, I threw this in here, but I didn't have a good diagram for it. But it is important to know you don't you don't have to have just one um, cylinder per solenoid. So a lot of times when we'll, when we start building mechanisms, you'll have two cylinders that need to move together. So say you have um, some sort of intake or something that needs to deploy down, you'll have a cylinder on each side of it. You can plumb the tubing back to a single solenoid, and it'll just control them at the same time. Um, it's a pretty common misconception that you have to have one cylinder, solenoid per cylinder, and that's just not true. Um, it doesn't work the other way. So in, in the rules, we're not allowed to have multiple solenoids control one cylinder, but you can have multiple, you can have a single solenoid control multiple cylinders. Sorry if that's confusing. The words are semi-similar. Um, let me get the controls away here in a second. The solenoid pictures down here show you basically that there are five ports, which is a little confusing. Um, but, the, but the important thing to know is basically on the bottom over on the right side where those three are, for the most part, we only use the center one. The center one is where we actually feed in our pressurized air. And then the top, those two on the top on the left side, is where we switch between the two sides of the cylinder. Um, the other two on the bottom, we're going to look at in just a second when we look at like a cross section. Um, those are basically just where the air goes when we exhaust it. Um, so we don't really have to do anything. That's already open to the atmosphere. That's all we really care about. Um, so those just can stay with nothing connected to them, um, and they work fine. So. We're going to briefly look at what a solenoid looks like on the inside. So there is a full video. We're not going to go through it today. Um, but if you're curious and want to learn more, I recommend watching it. It's pretty good. It shows you um, all of the movement and things. Um, but basically, this is what a solenoid looks like on the inside. We have this, um, what's labeled P here is where we bring in our pressurized air at the bottom. So this bottom middle one, if the thing would go away, this bottom middle one is P. Um, and then that is where our pressurized airs go. I need to move those pictures probably. Um, and then this rod on the inside here has all of these little um, um, kind of larger points, little discs, and they're there to stop air, um, depending on which position it's in. So in its current position, this disc is over on the right side, and it's stopping air from going to the right. So the pressurized air comes up, goes to the left, and goes out the A port. Um, and then the B port is connected to its exhaust port, basically. So it's able to just go out. We normally don't connect anything over here, so it's just able to go out into the open air. And the A side gets pressurized, so that would mean our cylinder moves out just like it's doing right here. If we were to um, engage the solenoid, so the solenoid has um, basically an electromagnet, so it's able to attract this rod um, and move it to the left. 
So if this whole thing moves to the left, you can imagine that this little piece right here would now be blocking air from going out this way. Um, this little piece would block air from going out that way. And now our pressurized air would go up and out the B channel. And the air that was in A would be able to go down and out the R channel. Um, so that's how it's able to move it back and forth and kind of choose which one do we want, A or B. And when we're doing that, we can choose which way we want the cylinder to go, either out when we feed A or in when we feed B. Uh, okay. Um, should have probably been earlier, but it's still useful now. Um, so because we have that regulator that's able to set our um, pressure that we actually use on our what's known as like the working side or the low side of our system, um, the rules basically tell us that we're only allowed to use 60 PSI in our actual solenoids and cylinders. We're not allowed to have it ever be above that. Um, so everything over here, that's why like, the tubing moves to green, it's the working side, um, it would be 60 PSI or below, and everything over on the other side is allowed to be up to 120 PSI by the rules. So this is our high side of our system, um, so we have it lit with like the red tubing over here, and we'd have one gauge that's able to read that, so we'd be able to look at it and see if it was um, 120 PSI or less, and we have another gauge on our low side that's able so that we are able to read it and make sure that it's 60 psi or less. Um, again, this is a very simplified model of the whole pneumatic system. We may have any number of storage tanks. We may have any number of solenoids. We may have any number of cylinders. Um, but everything in here is basically required to have the most basic setup for a um, pneumatic system in the way that we do it and that's legal within the rules. Um, okay, so now looking back at this kind of real life view, we can see um, some of the connections in real life compared to how they look in the model. So this silver thing back here is the compressor. It's cut off a little bit by this um, piece of metal, but you can kind of see the body of it and comes up in that kind of L the same thing that's happening right here. Um, and the output of the compressor um, has the pressure switch on it and the pressure relief valve, but they're all mounted in this kind of cross. That was just the way that we could get it to fit in the space. Um, the actual shape of whatever connector and things you use doesn't necessarily matter with pneumatics. As long as the air can get there, it's gonna fill whatever volume it's attached to. Um, so in this picture, it was a straight line, so it was easier for me to draw. Um, but in our robot in 2018, it was a cross. Um, and then it had another um, a little tube connector right here that has tubing. Um, so where this tubing would go is the same place where this tubing would go. So it would go out to our storage tanks, and it would go out to our gauge and regulator and our other gauge. Um, those aren't in the picture. They're actually like right above the picture, I believe. So they got cut off you know, the back of them. Because so these are all mounted um, nicely on the robots so that we can access them really easily and see them, right? Because we need to be able to look at our gauges. Um, so this is like a picture from inside the robot. We don't wouldn't want to have to have our head in here um, to actually look at the gauges. So we normally mount them nicely on the outside somewhere to where we can actually see them. Um, but yeah, so this tube would go out to our storage tanks and to our gauges and regulator. And then from there, from the regulator, we have a tube that comes back in and you can kind of just see this orange connector down here. And that's the input for all of these solenoids. So each one of these little um, caps right here is a solenoid. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So there are six solenoids on here. And they're all fed through this thing down at the bottom called a manifold. Um, so each of the solenoids is mounted on this manifold. And that basically just lets us have a single place to put air into all of all six of those uh, solenoids. So instead of having to have um, a bunch of connectors on a bunch of tubing to let us connect to six uh, solenoids, we can do it all with just this one um, block of aluminum. So it saves a lot of space. 
it's a lot easier. There's a lot less, fewer chances for leaks. Um, so that's normally how we do it on our competition robots. Um, and then each of these have two outputs. Some of them aren't even being used. So these little black sticks coming up are just plugs. So they basically are in place of having a cylinder connected to them at all. So like these two aren't being used at all right now. They're just like extra if we needed to add a cylinder or something, we have them ready. Um, it's not too much weight or we may have like had a use for them at one point and then we took something off the robot maybe and then just plugged them up. Um, and then we have tubing going out to all of the rest of our cylinders everywhere in the robot. Um, there's a couple things we do on our robots that are just kind of convenient. So we have some color labels so we know which one is which. Um, so it's easy to be like, OK, it's the green solenoid we're looking at. And we can figure out what's wrong with it. Maybe something happened to the wire. Something's not firing for some reason. Um, and we have that tied back somewhere else to know that it's the green one in a document somewhere. Um, and then we also have, and then the tubings also get wrapped with colors too. So like here we have a, a red wrap on this tube. So we know it goes to the red solenoid. Um, we also have different color tubing. So we have white and clear tubing. Um, the reason for that is we want to know, um, sometimes we'll disconnect one of the cylinders and we don't know which way the tubing goes back all the time. But for um, um, Spectrum robots, it's supposed to be that the white tube is the one that plugs into the back of the cylinder to extend the, cyl the, the cylinder. So white would plug in back here because it's going to, when the air comes in, it's going to push the rod out. And the clear tube goes to the front so that when you push air through the clear tube, it retracts the cylinder or brings it back in. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what it looks like. You have the PCM mounted over here on the wall in 2018. So it was mounted kind of vertically. And we have all of those wires going from the PCM to um, each of these solenoids. And we have some more wires going from the PCM to the compressor and to the pressure switch. You can't see them all. They're all like kind of wrapped under things. Um, the actual robot gets a little um, cramped in things, but we lay it all out nicely. We figure out where everything is. So it's not too bad when you're actually looking at it yourself. Looking at it from just a picture makes it a little bit tricky to see where everything's going. Um, OK. There are a host of other pneumatics uh, manuals and references and resources, um, including some stuff that we've written that's a little bit more advanced if people want to start getting ahead. Um, so if you have more questions, there's definitely places to get answers. Um, but this is largely how we actually use pneumatics and the control side of it um, to be able to move things in and out. So in future um, training, we'll talk about how we actually determine the size of a cylinder and things. A lot of that's more in design training. Um, so when we're designing a system, if we're designing an intake or an arm or something that has to move with pneumatics, we have to choose um, how long the cylinder is, right? So how far does it push in and out? Uh, and also how big of a diameter does it have? Um, and there's ways that we figure out all of that stuff. Um, but for the most part, everything we talked about today is all you need to know to be able to hook up a basic um, pneumatic system and have it running on the robot. If you just needed to go um, and move a cylinder in and out, we could do that um, with what we talked about today.